if you think that someone's upset or disengaged or you, and you have to kind of fill in the gaps yourself, you might make up a story that's way worse than the fact that their kid's sick or, you know, something like right. that. All right. So shifting into wellness, you know, the other side is, is checking on the person, not checking on the progress or the work, but on the person. How do you actually keep a pulse on your employees wellness on how they're feeling as part of these check ins or part of this this uh, remote work? Yeah, so so in range, we have a, the check in has a mood. Um, so it's self reported, of course, and, and there's a lot of caveats into the, you know, the effectiveness of that of that, but that is kind of like the the backbone pulse and that's cr kind of like a quick check uh, like am i green am i tired like how am i showing up today am i really sick am i red um and it's kind of this like ambient information but that on its own is not going to be enough because you have to have that level of um psychological safety in order to share that and then also there's you need you know you need to get more color so we we kind of like try and sense in a bunch of ways. We, we have a lot of openness around um, like how we're doing. So every meeting starts with a check-in round where you say like how you're showing up, if there's anything on your mind. And as leaders, we try and role model um, that very openly. So I've had a lot of sleep problems with my children and I, I will often say like, oh man, I've been up, up, up all night with my kids. So I'm pretty tired. Um, and you know, the other leaders model it. And then that helps surface information. And really the goal of that is not about um, it's not about like tallying who's feeling good and who's feeling bad. It's about sharing context because that's how you show up mm. to the meeting. Um, and then it diffuses some of those tensions. So if you're tired or like stressed, you will react to me differently than if you're like super happy. And if I don't know what's causing that stress and anxiety, or I don't know that you are stressed and anxiety, I will write a story. And I might think, oh, Chris is just, he's pissed off with me or like he's upset with me. And real the reality is you're just tired. And, and uh, so much, you know, team and organizational tension arises for the from these like subtle interactions that were relatively you know mundane or you know honest yeah it's true i if if you think that someone's upset or disengaged or you, and you have to kind of fill in the gaps yourself you might make up a story that's way worse than the fact that their kid's sick or you know something like right. that so how, how do you take all these individually reported moods and see some kind of macro picture for the organization. Like, it is, I assume you have yeah. something like that. Well, at the moment, we we only have a two week history because we we don't want. I think there's a, a fine balance here. Like, and you don't want someone to draw the wrong conclusion or use it for, um, you know, you, you don't want someone to come and say, "Hey, Chris, like you've been read three times this week. Like, what's going on? You need to shake <laughs> it up, right?" It's kind of like the office day thing with like you're not wearing too much flair. <laughs> Um, or you're not wearing enough flair. Um, so, so we currently only show two weeks history and, it's, and that gives you a good pulse and that helps you understand whether projects need to be reprioritized. And we had a customer who said that their entire team checked in yellow one day and as a result of it, they pushed the deadline out of their project hmm. two weeks. And it was like this really good sense, sensing signal that the team was getting burnt out. So I think in the future, we will, we will show um, more historical trends, but I think we need to do it very carefully and very you know, um, really think about how this information is going to be used and how to avoid it being used for, you know, nefarious purposes. <laughs> right. Data mining. And uh, if if a manager is listening to this and they're doing check-ins with their people, uh, you know, they, they, they may say that, you know, I, my people aren't being honest with me. They're not sharing if they're not in a bad mood. And so how do you create a, a culture that has the right psychological safety and, and to, to make people feel like they can share? Yeah. So, so one way to think about it is it's um, it's kind of like contagious. Psychological safety is contagious, and um, Daniel Coyle talks about this in Culture Code. And really, since since Google's project Aristotle, a lot of people have talked about psychological safety. But we haven't really talked about how to create that psych psychological safe environment. So the, the formula that I like is actually pretty simple. It starts with vulnerability. And the vulnerability leads to trust, which is a little bit unintuitive because you think you have to trust someone in order to be vulnerable. But if I share a little bit about myself with you, you will trust me more and probably share a bit more about y yourself. So we start with vulnerability that leads to trust. Trust then leads to belonging. Belonging to me is much more tangible and I can understand what a sense of belonging means. Then if you, if you have that sense of belonging, then you, that leads to psychological safety. So as a team, how do you create a sense of belonging? Um, it has to be about the connections between each of the teammates. There has to be opportunities to, you know, 
share bits about yourself um, or at least be vulnerable at, at like a it can be relatively superficial level. It doesn't have to be bare your soul and like talk to your team in the way that you talk to a therapist. It can just be, I like football or like, oh man, I really hate mushrooms. I can't believe you have mushrooms on pizza. Like these little things are like they humanize you and they, they, they express like parts of your personality. And that's like what lends leads, leads to the trust. So it, it, almost like the little fun icebreakers at the beginning of a meeting to just share weird facts. It sort of disarms people, right? Yeah. Exactly. And, and, our, and our meeting tool does have a, a um, we have a module that allows you to run an icebreaker um, at the start of every meeting. And, it, you know, it's kind of, kind of fun. And the funny thing is, like, we have we have this agency we work with and we do the icebreaker at the end of the meeting and they find things about each other. You know, they're working together all the time. We just have one meeting a week with them, but they find things about each other um, through these icebreakers that they would otherwise wouldn't know. So that is kind cool. of funny. At our all hands meetings, we do breakout rooms with the whole team. And so they'll get randomly put with, you know, four or five others. And we always have these, these random prompts. Mm-hmm. And th- those are some of my most fun times. It's a, you know, a 10 minute thing, but it's with people that you don't often work with and they're across departments and you learn so much about people. And then when you see them or work on a project yeah. with them, you're that much more comfortable because you remember that story they told about their yeah. Halloween costume, you know? Yeah, totally. It's it's, it's essentially building a a strong fabric, you know, of connections in the organization. Uh, And it has to be, you know, it has to be a human fabric of connections. 